You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. Just be cool, man. I'm cool, you be cool. And Big Anklevich. I'm cool, you just be cool. Hey, man. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Yeah, episode 131, man. <laughs> Yo, man, is that the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, man? Yeah. We'll crank it up, man. This is Rich Outfield, man. Okay, I can't do it. And I'm Big Anklevich, man. That was lame even for you. And that really is saying something. All right, all right, you made your point. Uh, this is Rish. And I'm Big. Welcome to the show. I think we have a story today. We do. We have a story. Why am I always shocked by that? I don't know. Maybe it's just because you expect yourself to underachieve. And when we actually manage to get a story, it's more than you thought would happen. I don't know. That's the way I feel. Been underachieving for so long that... What you need to do is ask yourself, why not? That's a good idea. Why not underachieve more? (laughs) (laughs) There you go. (laughs) What's the story today, sir? Today's story is The Appliance of Science by Sheila Crosby. Yeah, not the Sheila Crosby that you've heard on all the other shows. The famous Italian opera singer, (laughs) Sheila Crosby, yes. That's right. This is Sheila Crosby. Sheila Crosby is a British writer voluntarily exiled to the Spanish island of La Palma. Now, where might the Spanish island of La Palma be, you might ask? I would imagine it's off the coast of Spain, perhaps in the Canary Islands. I think you might be right. She went there with a six-month contract to work at the telescopes of the Royal Greenwich Observatory and has stayed there 20 years so far. A male at home... Has just piled up like you wouldn't believe. (laughs) These days, she works as a tour guide at the observatory and is writing a guidebook to the observatory. She also writes about the island at her blog. Link in the show notes? Right. The Appliance of Science was first published in Colin Harvey's Showcase in February 2004 and again in Escape Velocity in December of 2007. Also, you can buy her quirky science fiction anthology, The Dodo, Dragon, and Other Stories, from Amazon or her website. Check the links in the show notes. Huh. Who produced today's episode, sir? Today's episode was produced by the buttery-voiced Tobias Queen. How many times did he produce it, would you say? He said that he recorded it three times, or thrice. But the third time apparently was the charm because the other two he accidentally deleted. But he did say this one was the best. So there's that. Sometimes practice makes perfect. But most of the time, practice just makes tired. All right. (laughs) I wouldn't know. (laughs) Enjoy. That's right. The Appliance of Science by Sheila Crosby. The fridge had gone missing again. All that was left was a rectangle of gleaming blue tiles where it had stood, surrounded by a ring of black grease. Jose moaned softly. His hangover screamed through his brain like a pig being slaughtered. His mouth Tasted like a mud wrestler's jockstrap. He needed orange juice and coffee, urgently. He dragged off to the bathroom to search for aspirin, bum first like a baby, with his crippled feet trailing behind him. The medicine cabinet had gone missing too. But the fridge was standing under the shower. He felt too ill to ask why. Orange juice, he mumbled. Say please, said the fridge. Jose groaned. Thirst won out over frustration, and he surrendered. Good morning, fridge. Orange juice, please, he said. Good morning. It's Friday, 26th, February, 2027. The juice appeared in the delivery window. You don't need to tell me the year every morning. I do remember, you know. You're hungover again, aren't you? Continued fridge. Why you don't learn to control your drinking is beyond me. 
Why, only last week you- Shut up or I'll core dump you, said Jose. He'd only got drunk because it was carnival anyway. Nothing like as good as carnival in Santa Cruz de la Tenerife, but La Palma put on a reasonable show. He kneeled, grabbed the juice, and drained the whole carton. Uh, have you seen medicine cabinet? He asked. Fridge's silence was eloquent. Even though Fridge had no face, Jose could feel the pout. Jose was in no state for this. On the other hand, he didn't feel up to reprogramming Fridge's personality just now. Please tell me where medicine cabinet has gone. I don't know. Thank you for telling me that. Milk, please. A glass of milk appeared. It might be in the bedroom. They're collaborating on a musical. A musical? Was this the audio equivalent of seeing pink elephants? Oh, and don't worry about our personal fulfillment, Jose. I like standing in the same place all day, keeping your pizzas frozen. It's the summit of Bed's ambitions to wait around all day in case you happen to fancy a nap. Why on earth would any of us want hobbies? Jose rubbed his splitting forehead. Uh huh. Me and Shower here, we play chess. Not that you'd be interested. Bonds to King Rook Three, said Shower. Fascinating, mumbled Jose, and slithered off to find the medicine cabinet. Don't forget you've got four strawberry yogurts that'll be past their sell by date in two days, Fridge called after him. These old Canarian houses were tiny. It must have been a real squash in the old days, bringing up ten kids in here. But it made it easy to shuffle around. Jose heard singing from the bedroom. When you hurt me and desert me, you do more than disconcert me, warbled the medicine cabinet. It was right above the bed. He'd been too hungover to notice. Cool said Bed. Really neat internal rhymes. Excuse me, mumbled Jose. Aspirin, please. He washed them down with milk, collected his crutches, and left Bed and Cabinet composing a song about a vivacious vacuum cleaner called Monica. Jose stopped abruptly just before he swung in front of the French windows. Opaque, please, he muttered. The windows darkened, and he stumbled past in the sudden gloom. Clear, please. And his front room lightened again. For the millionth time, he wished that he'd stuck with plain old curtains. His original idea had been for the French windows, which were also his front door, to turn opaque automatically whenever he wandered in front of it in the nude, something he tended to do first thing in the morning. Donna Augustias, who lived opposite, was scandalized. Provincial, she was. He'd brought the windows online a month ago, and they still hadn't caught on. Still, at least they didn't wander around the house, or nag. Back in the kitchen, the cupboard had coffee and sugar ready. Whenever he was hungover, Jose had his coffee with three sugars. He made toast, then couldn't face it, so he had more coffee. The screeching in his head subsided to a wail. You know... You'd feel better if you had something to eat, said Cupboard. Can't face it. Half a bowl of Fruit Loops? Shut up! Sorry. Designing and building intelligent appliances had been a big mistake. It had kept him busy enough after the fluffy kitten put him on crutches. In fact, he got so absorbed he'd gone well beyond his original design. First, he bought a truckload of flood-damaged robot arms and converted them into appliance legs with casters and claws. It was only later that he admitted to himself that he wanted them to walk because he couldn't. They even had state-of-the-art batteries. Then, he carried on AI programming where his degree course left off and gave them personalities. He thought they'd keep him company. Who else would be friends with a cripple, he reasoned. Especially a godo, someone from the Spanish mainland. But it was worse than being alone. They were all such chatterboxes. Any one of them by itself would have been fine for a while. But living with all of them, all the time, was driving him nuts. He had no privacy at all. It was like being married without the sex. That was another thing. 
if by some miracle he ever found a girlfriend, she'd never agree to make love to him on a talking bed that might well provide a running commentary. Say, Jose, aren't you going a little fast for her? I think her left breast could use more attention. He'd been so engrossed in his creations that he never gave a thought to marketing them until his disability lump sum ran out. Then he found nobody would have them in the house. By then, he barely had enough money for food, let alone modifications or advertising. Food. Maybe cereal wasn't such a bad idea. Hey, cupboard. Can I change my mind about those Fruit Loops? Sure. A packet of gofio, canary and porridge, appeared on the delivery conveyor belt. No cupboard. Fruit Loops, please. We've run out. Anyway, imported cereals are expensive, and gofios sell much better for you. Jose gave in. He juggled crutches as he filled a pan with milk, heated it on the stove, then added gofio and stirred. His breakfast was ready. I've been thinking. How would you guys feel about it if I reprogrammed you and made you less intelligent so you wouldn't get so bored? There was a distinct pause before the cupboard answered. Put it this way, Jose. How would you feel about having a full frontal lobotomy? No boredom. No worries. Just sit back in an institution and relax. Jose spent the whole day on the beach, nursing his hangover and guilt. His mood was as black as the West Canarian sand. The machines he'd created had a rotten life. They felt as frustrated as he did, or worse. Maybe it would be kinder to switch them off, like having a dog put to sleep. But then dogs didn't write musicals and play chess. It was too close to murder. In some ways, they were his children. What on earth could he do? It was late evening when he finally got home, and he was still no nearer to a decision. Jose sat down to recover from the journey up the steep, cobbled street on his crutches. Then he made spaghetti, only to push it round and round on his plate. He tried to read, but he couldn't concentrate. He couldn't even think aloud, because his machines would hear. If he did switch them off, it would have to be quickly, before they knew what was happening. There were six of them. Whatever he did, five would see it coming. He gave it up as insoluble and went to bed. Bed sang him to sleep. Jose had nightmares. He attacked the fridge with an axe, and it screamed in pain. Lights flashed with each blow as the wiring short-circuited. His arms were covered in blood. He woke sweating and trembling to find himself in another dream. Somewhere, a brass band played a dirge, but the music was almost drowned out by the wailing. She's dead! Hi! Oh, it's me! He felt cold and pulled the blankets higher. Bed lurched along in a procession where everyone was dressed in black, and many of them staring and pointing at him. Yo, look at this, man! Jose was still half asleep and mesmerized by the swaying crinoline of the girl in front. He caught a whiff of incense. Oh, this is a weird dream, he said. Oh, this isn't a dream, said Bed. This is the sardine's funeral. This was the climax to carnival every year. The town hall held a funeral for a giant papier-mâché sardine, and every weirdo in town joined the procession. Jose loved it, but he had lost track of the date. What? Jose forgot both his nudity and his smashed legs and leapt out of the bed. He immediately fell over, of course. The girl in front turned, showing a perfectly made-up face framed by a thick beard. She laughed and nudged the girl next to her. The other girl had a suspiciously large Adam's apple, but she filled out her silk basque delightfully. Was she or wasn't he? Jose couldn't tell, 
Nice one. She, he said. He saved his modesty with a dirty oregano crisp bag and hastily crawled back in, then pulled the sheet up to his waist. But why? What are we doing in the procession? Even his own voice sounded unreal. It was normally at least two octaves deeper. I wanted to see it before I die, said Bed. What? Before you what? You talked in your sleep. You can't live with us anymore. No one else will have us. We have no way to defend ourselves. So, I thought I'd have one last fling before I go. It's all perfectly logical. It was several seconds before Jose thought to shut his mouth. The logic still escaped him. Just because I dreamed it, it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. Oh. Bed stopped walking. What are you going to do then? I don't know. Oh. Bed lurched off again. Well, now that we're here, we might as well see the fun and fireworks. A flashlight stabbed his eyes. Hi. What do you think you're doing? Jose was bewildered. He squinted past the light and saw a curvaceous woman with her right hand on her hip. Then he knew he was dreaming. He said, Hi, scrumptious. She switched the flashlight off and he saw she wore the green Civil Guard uniform and her right hand was resting on her gun butt. Her hair was dark blonde and her eyes were a startling ice blue, leveled at him like scud missiles. He swallowed. Uh, uh, good evening, senora. <laughs> the missiles looked him up and down. I repeat, what do you think you're doing? Oh dear, it's all very complicated, senora. I don't think you're going to believe this. The Scud missiles started their launch procedure. Try me. Well, when the fluffy kitten put me on crutches... She raised one eyebrow. No, well... Look... I had a summer job at the Picture Framers by the Alameda, right? One of the customers brought in her kitten on the way back from the vet. She was stopping by to pick up her granny's embroidery. The kitten escaped, of course, and we all had to catch the fu- the darn thing. It was like a Keystone Cops film. Piles of sheet glass getting knocked over and exploding like fireworks. I'll some hit you. No. Jose winced. He hated telling the next bit. I got the kitten back in the basket, then I went out to find its owner. I was punch drunk by then, and I walked it straight into the guys delivering new glass. I've been on crutches ever since. The civil guard bit her upper lip, visibly trying not to laugh. Most people weren't that polite, but it was still pretty humiliating. What could he expect? The police officer swallowed. What color, kitten, sir? White. White? The scud missiles turned into blue summer skies. So after the fluffy white kitten put you on crutches? I was stuck at home with the settlement and nothing to do. I couldn't carry on at university, of course. Why not? People do. Jose looked at her with his mouth open. Why not? In seven months, he'd never once asked himself that question and there'd been nobody else around to ask it either. Jose rubbed his chin. He must have been on his own too much. A feat of self-pity, I suppose. She nodded, still biting her lip. Well, there I was at home with all this time and money, so I created a bunch of intelligent appliances. The bed here has an AI personality and can fetch things and perform simple tasks. Hey, Bed shouted. You call writing my own musical simple? Jose glared at Bed's visual recognition sensor. It's also very good at interrupting. Sorry, said Bed. And while I was asleep tonight, Bed decided he wanted to see the sardine's funeral. Best night of the year, chimed in Bed. True, agreed the guard. Jose shrugged. So he came here, brought me with him, and I only just woke up, and I can't get out of bed because my pajamas are back at my apartment. You saying your bed likes to travel? Sure, said Bed. I got my retirement all planned. In case Jose ever gets this sorted, I want to see Venice and a space shuttle launch and 
I'd really like to see my musical staged. Oh, and windsurfing must be really neat. This time, the policewoman laughed out loud. She had a surprisingly <laughs> deep laugh. Suddenly, Jose wanted her to stay forever. Won't you sit down, senora? Lola, <laughs> she said, and sat down on the foot of the bed, draping herself against the footboard. Jose couldn't believe the way she kept looking at his chest. It was too good to be true. He shot a worried glance at it. No, he hadn't mysteriously acquired pink satin bows in his chest hair. The only thing he noticed was that heaving himself around on crutches had done wonders for his pectorals and biceps, and Lola couldn't see his smashed feet. Maybe he had a chance here. Please God, let him have a chance. Should he just ask for her phone number, straight out? So, uh, Lola, how long have you been in the civil garb? Lola threw back her head and roared with laughter. <laughs> Jose thought he was dreaming again. Then it made sense. You're not a green fly. It's a carnival costume. I'm an astronomy student from Tenerife. I just finished observing with one of the telescopes up the mountain. It's a great costume. How did you get the gun? It's a toy, of course. <laughs> Why? She raised an eyebrow. Can you help me find the gun that really shoots? Jose's mouth went dry. Oh, lordy, said Bed. My battery's real low. We gotta go, Jose. And Bed shot off home, sending Lola's perfect behind flying <laughs> over her head. Psst, you awake, Jose? Jose was awake all right, but he lay staring up at the blackness and refused to answer. All he could think of was luscious Lola and his missed chance. She was the first woman, and what a woman, to show any interest in him in two years. It was the last straw. The machines had to go. The only question was how. Next morning, he disconnected Bed's battery. For maintenance, he said. Bed wasn't too worried. He couldn't move because he was plugged into the mains. But medicine cabinet kept him company, and they had a marathon songwriting session. As Jose sat on bed, pretending to tinker with the recharging electronics, he could hear Cabinet warbling on about how the sexy vacuum cleaner had left him for a cheatin' car wash. It was going to be a truly awful musical. It was going to be an unfinished musical. Jose stopped, overwhelmed with guilt. Then he remembered the way Lola had ogled his chest. He gritted his teeth, then acted surprised. Hey, this condenser looks like it's been getting hot. I'll have to get a new one. Guess I better check the others before I go. He went round, checking batteries, and leaving them all disconnected, saying he'd mend them when he got back. Then he strapped on his rucksack and made his way to the French windows. With his back to the room so the appliances couldn't see what he was doing, he opened up the fuse box. Bye, guys, he yelled cheerfully and pulled the breaker. Silence. Beautiful, sumptuous silence. He lurched around, unplugging the appliances. Then he switched the power back on and hobbled to the kitchen to make coffee. He sat in the delicious silence and slowly drank his coffee. After that, he carefully removed Fridge's brain and switched it back on. It took half the day to remove the brains from the appliances because it was impossible to carry the toolkit and manage his crutches, but he swore to his heart's content without Fridge telling him off. Eventually, he had all the appliances' brains stored under the kitchen sink. Towards evening, the silence got a little heavy, so he decided to fix the TV. It had refused to switch on weeks ago, but he'd never missed it until now. He found it needed a new transformer, which he couldn't afford. He went to bed early, and then he couldn't sleep because bed couldn't sing to him anymore. Next day, he went to the Plaza España to escape the silence. He looked so miserable that a talentless street musician gave him five euros. The evening was 
endless. He'd read the paper twice. He couldn't concentrate on his book. The only jigsaw in the house had a picture of fluffy white kittens. For over a year, the appliance's chatter had drowned out any awkward questions about the way he lived and where he was going. Now, questions screamed at him in the deafening silence. Just how much of this mess was his own fault? On the third day, he'd had enough. He dragged the brains out from under the sink and painstakingly reinstalled them. He switched on the mains. Well, shouted Fridge, that wasn't very nice. You bastard, shouted Bed. You absolute, complete, utter bastard. I think you owe us an explanation, Jose, said Cupboard. Jose only grinned. He picked up the post. Good. The application form had come. He swung off to the living room to fill it in. No more wallowing in self-pity for him. Jose was applying for a scholarship at the University on Tenerife. The appliances ought to impress the selectors, so he had a pretty good chance, and he might even find Lola there. And now, a word about today's story. When I worked for the Royal Greenwich Observatory, I used to share an office with a friend and a peculiar bookcase where the books seemed to move around by themselves. We used to joke that the bookshelf was far too intelligent to just stand there all day holding books, so it teased us to relieve the boredom. When my friend was going through a tough patch, I wrote this story to cheer her up. The bored bookshelf morphed into a smarty-pants bed with wanderlust. I didn't have to think too hard about where the bed would take Jose to. The sardine's funeral is a real fiesta, one of many on La Palma, although probably the most surreal. After that, the rest of the story fell into place rather easily. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Now, if we enjoyed listening to it half as much as she enjoyed writing it, she still enjoyed it twice as much as us. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> See, I, I never really understand that. If you could do a diagram so I could understand. A pie chart. Okay. It's math. I was told there would be no math. During the debates, yes. <laughs> so I think this story sort of burnt out poor Tobias Queen. Yeah, Queen. that whole recording something three times, it, it's easy to do that to somebody when that happens. How many, again, the math, of our producers would you say have experienced something like that? I would say several. I mean, I know that at the very least you and I have experienced that several times and we've talked about it on the show where we're just like, uh... This is the third time where we did this. We had it and we recorded for two hours and then the computer died at the end. Or we realized that we had never hit record and so we were just talking into the mics for fun. Yeah, that's a fairly common thing. You, you think you know what you're doing. You get into a groove and then you missed clicking one important thing. Are we recording? Okay, we are. Just thought I'd better check. It's like waking the gremlins or something when you mention those kind of things. Last week we were recording an episode and we got to the end. Or we almost to the uh, signing off part. And I believe I said something like, how long have we been recording? And you like moved the mouse to wake the computer up so we could find out. And it wouldn't wake up. It had died. And uh, for once... We still had the file. Usually they're gone. Yeah, something had happened and it actually saved it. I was amazed. We played back the recording and it said, how long have we been recording? Let me check. And then it went silent. <laughs> and you're like, oh, thank goodness. But uh, usually the diagnosis is much more dire. Oh, yeah. It's always start over. And that is so depressing. Every time something like that happens to me, it, it takes like an extra, extra amount of will to go back and do that same damn thing a second time. I hate it so much. I'd rather just... Not do it at all. Yeah, just throw it out. Okay, uh, let's write this author back and tell him their story's rejected. I hate there's it. There's something soul-crushing about it. Why? It why? is. I don't know. Just something about doing work for nothing. But if it were something you were doing at your job... You'd be upset, but you'd have to do it again, right? 
Yeah, well, is it, obviously. Is it that we're doing this in our spare time? I mean, unless that. people donate to the show. Okay. Link right there. <laughs> That's right. right. It could be that. I don't know. I mean, sometimes that happens to me. Like I've said before, you know, I work in news and news is ever changing. There's been lots of times where, you know, we're doing a show and we get the whole show ready, totally ready to go. And the baseball game that you know, we're waiting to end before our news starts. Never ends. It just keeps going and going and going. And it's like one o'clock or whatever. And they're in the... I read about that, that month long baseball game. They're in like the 16th inning and they're still going and they just never have the show. And you're just like, oh, that worked. The whole night's work and we never used it. And that's pretty frustrating. Or sometimes, you know, just a little story. Like you do the one story, you get it all put together and then something happens and it turns out, oh, that story's not something we can air. And so we don't air it and all the work you did on it. Well, I think everybody who's a writer has written a story or, or a work in progress or half of a novel and then it's lost. The computer dies. The notebook that they were writing it in disappears. Right. The earth comes to an end just as written in, in the Mayan calendar and uh, you lose it all. And it's really frustrating. It's, it's more frustrating than the end of the world. It is, yes. Dang. That's happened. I, and I feel the same way when that happens. That's happened to me when I, like, I'll be working on a story. I write a large portion of it, and then, yeah, the computer freezes as you're about to hit save. While you're saving it, it freezes. You know, that kind of crap. Sometimes it feels like the universe is purposefully trying to piss you off, trying to crush your soul. It happens as you're saving it or something, and yeah, you lose it all. And then to go back, the worst part is you know that what you wrote the last time is better. You rewrite the whole bit, and you're just like, oh, this is not as good as that first time when I wrote it. And it was all, I was inspired then. Now I'm just trying to recreate that inspiration that never works. So I I guess this is a roundabout way of saying thank you, Tobias. Yes. And uh, to those who aren't Tobias, donate to the show. (laughs) <laughs> so this story was sent to us a while back. Well, there's no stories that get sent to us and immediately we produce them. The closest we've ever come was uh, Jan Perkins sent us a, a chemo story that we recorded like that same week, but it still hasn't aired. Yeah, it, it, we, right. it was supposed to air, then it didn't air. And I have like so many other things. I feel guilty about it, but I have other things like uh, that story that I accepted in August that I still haven't finished, I feel like, well, that has to take priority over something. That- right. You know, I think there's a way we can make it up to J.M. Perkins, though. Yes, you recently had a child. It cries way too much. It costs a lot to maintain. And uh, make your announcement. We're going to give him the child. No, actually, what I was going to talk about is, uh, I think we mentioned, on That Gets My Goat, wasn't it? So nobody heard that mention. So I'll totally talk about it again. There's there's this thing that he was doing called a Kickstarter campaign, which apparently is a way where you can raise money for a project. Usually, or I guess it's not necessarily that way, but an artistic endeavor is commonly the money is raised this way. You put it out there. You say, I want to do this artistic endeavor. Donate money to me. And if I get so much, then I can do it. If I don't, If they don't get enough money, then all the money is returned to the people who donated and the project doesn't go forward. The reason, you know, we we got that idea and we we heard that idea, I should say, and we thought, hey, why don't we try that? And so we were going to do a Kickstarter to get the money to go and see Battleship in the D-Box and do an episode about it. To force me to go see Battleship. Right. We wound up just doing it without the Kickstarter thing because it was uh, quite a process to get that all set up. Right. We wanted like $40. Yeah. And and the effort, because you had to write out like tax forms. Yeah, they wanted all sorts of crap. And I was just like, okay, we want $40, not $4,000. So we didn't do it that way. We just did it through our regular donations. But J.M. Perkins has done, what, two chemo stories on our air already. And we've got a third one coming soon. And uh, he is trying to get money via his Kickstarter campaign to create the entire chemo novel or anthology. To to, to release it in book form. Right, to release it in book form. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's doing some kind of an e-book form as well. But to do the book form of the chemo novel slash anthology. I'm not sure what you'd call it because it's a series of stories. Does that make it an anthology? 
well, I don't know. Maybe it's like iRobot or Martian Chronicles or something right. like that. It's a series of connected stories, except for I believe that the, their format is slightly different as a novel than they are in the short story versions. Am I wrong? Probably. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> but he. Uh, I was saying you were probably correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, he shared with us the Town of Golden Woods and the Condemned, and this this third one. And they're all about the same main character and his missions, his exploits, his day-to-day life with the organization of Chemo. So it's sort of episodic. But the novel tells us how he got hooked up with this group and him going through the... Going through to the end, whatever that is. We're not going to reveal the end because, you know, that would be a spoiler. And we don't know. And we don't know, yeah. Uh, So anyways, uh, we have like a trailer or a announcement or I don't know what you would call it for his Kickstarter campaign. So I thought, you know, to make it up to him, we'll play that real quick here. So, okay. 08OT, cue it up. With tooth and nail, with gun and blade, I've come. So begins the eighth battle here. A biofeedback device agent Joseph recites daily. As the newest recruit of the paramilitary cult Kibo, Joseph has pledged his life to battle cancers of the body of mankind. The group hunts everything from insane telekinetics to mimetic pathogens. Through every mission, Joseph will rely on the support and guidance of the man who once saved his life, Master Agent Burke. But when his mentor is forcibly inducted into the all-as-one high mind, Joseph and the organization he reluctantly served will have to face their most dangerous enemy yet. Kimo, how I learned to kill by J.M. Perkins. Support it on Kickstarter today. Support it today. That's right. Today. Is, is that really my voice? Is- it is. I'm pretty sure. See, instantly you said, oh, that's you. And I thought, that doesn't sound like me. You know, when you hear your voice played back. <laughs> That's funny. I've mostly gotten over that whole deal. Like, I know tons of people where they're just, like, a lot of authors where they're like, oh, I hate the sound of my voice, so I'm not going to do an author's note. I hate the look of my taint. (laughs) You know, we've been doing this for, what, four years or something like that? And so I've gotten over that whole, oh, sound of my voice. I can't stand my voice. It's, uh... I think I'm making a funny face in it. I, I, I keep this. Yeah, I've gotten over that, but other folks. You think Gilbert Gottfried hates the sound of his voice? <laughs> Everybody else does, so. Okay, so go to John's website. If you are interested in reading that, toss him a few bucks. Help him reach his goal. I think it would be really cool if our listeners helped him since... Uh, some of you probably know him from our show. Yeah, I think uh, our show is the only place that you can hear chemo stories. Uh, you, you, There was a rendition of one of our chemo stories that ran on another podcast. But uh, basically, yeah, here's where you heard them first. And I think the reaction that John got from his stories encouraged him to keep writing them and you know make this into a big thing so what you're trying to say is you're welcome i Uh, was actually saying yeah you guys demanded it so go and get it and i think the way kickstarter works too is you go and you pledge the money and when you're pledging money you're basically you're buying it you know what i mean you're buying the finished product so when he completes it and finishes it then he just sends you the thing because you already got the money you paid for it you don't have to go and oh now it's a book now i have to go buy it you bought it already i think that's how it works that's really neat now i know we already plugged it but he interviewed us for his podcast all right and that's where he brought up this idea and uh, we talked a little bit about how the chemo stories came to be and yeah we had something to do with that which makes me feel almost as good as when people donate (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, how many times is that? I don't know. Anyhow, check that out. I think you would enjoy it. And uh, let's talk about Appliance of Science again. Was the Appliance of Science when he applied to the science department in the university? Is that why it was called that? Or was it the appliances? Uh, no, it was I a think... play on words. That's not the same as a pun, right? When you're giving it like a double meaning. He applied... And there were appliances. 
Yes, very, very smart Sheila Crosby is. <laughs> uh, but plus, she's got a lovely English accent. Yeah. And all of us believe that that makes you smart. It does just... make you smart. And she lives on the Canary Islands, which means she must be smart. Because seriously, that's like, hey, I live in Hawaii. Automatically, you're smarter than most people because you're living in a wonderful place instead of a miserable place. Oh, okay. I, I, I couldn't connect the dots because I was like, because you speak. Hawaiian that makes you smart. You no, know, just, just cuz you're smart enough to live where life is good. Cool. Live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you soft. Or just stay and be soft. I don't know. I think that This is not the first author that we've published on our show that is a British expatriate living on the Canary Islands. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that is weird, is it not? I sense a conspiracy. I, 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 the other being Damon Shaw. That's right. Uh, the, the author of Whelp. Not Whelp. Whelp. <laughs> yeah, we did his story, uh, Whelp, <laughs> way back uh, a while ago. And uh, here we are doing another expat from Britain that also lives. I, I, I want to say that these people must know each other. But that isn't necessarily the case, I would, I would guess. We need to get them to meet up. Like the key master and the <laughs> gatekeeper. I think that would be extraordinarily bad. <laughs> right. So this story was a humorous story. It's funny because way back when it was submitted to us, it was a while ago when it was submitted. Of course, as we said already in this very show, we never get something done quickly. We get submitted a story and then it takes us forever to accept it. And then once we accept it, it takes even longer than forever to get it produced and put on the show. But do you think we would produce more quickly if people donated to the show? <laughs> and now it's time to beg for donations. No, I, I think I've been doing that. Yeah, really the whole long. show has been that, turns out. Thank you, though, announcer man. Did we? Never mind. <laughs> That's what she said. No, no. <laughs> You're still doing that wrong. Not that again. Anyways, you flummoxed, I you flummoxed you me with that. Oh, we don't get things done. But way back when, when this happened, I remember, and I think we've talked about it on the show before, but I was having this sort of crisis, this self-doubt moment. We would get stories that were humorous sent into the show, and I would read them, and I wouldn't find them humorous. Stories by Sheila Crosby? Not just Sheila Crosby, anybody who would send in a humorous story. For some reason, I just wouldn't get it. And I'd be like, this story was lame. And you're like, oh, no, it's so funny. You didn't like it? I, can't, I totally wanted to accept that one. To the point where Nicole sent us this story and said, hey, here's one that uh, made it through the uh, slush readers. They liked it. And she was already betting that this is going to come back and Big's going to say, oh, no, uh, you know, thanks for trying, but I'm not interested. And instead, when I accepted it, she wrote, I was almost positive you'd pass on this one. Damn, I guess I'll second guess myself more often. Also, she was disappointed <laughs> to have to send an acceptance letter. She That's got to be the worst part of her job. <laughs> she was disappointed that she still couldn't read me, I think. But I loved this one from the, from the moment that I read it. I don't know. There was something about it. Maybe it was the locale being set in the Canary Islands, being in the middle of a carnival parade, the funeral for the sardine, all that kind of stuff was just really interesting. Wait, wait, does that funeral for the sardine mean something to you? No. Okay. I don't know anything about Canary Island Carnival you don't know anything tradition. about their savage ways, is what you were. That's right. Was. That's right. I was going to say that, but I tried to make it PC. No, I'm glad you did. <laughs> you know, the idea was fun, and and it was humorous the whole way through. Just the crap that was going on, and the the musical that the appliances were writing, and Tommy Chong's voice. Wait, no, that wasn't that in was that. That was amusing. That wasn't in the first text draft quite yet. Here's a question for you. We. How many in a row does that make? Three? This is our third humorous story in a row. Are we a funny podcast? We better be, goddammit. How hard do I work? Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. It, you know, it's it's interesting, I think, because this year, the way the, the Parsec Awards work is they open nominations up 
and anybody can nominate a podcast. You could be a listener. You could be the guy that makes the podcast. You could be any old person because they don't make you like e-signature, e-whatever they call e-verify yourself as to being a real person. You know, like you always get the crap with online petitions where like Daffy Duck signed the damn petition. This thing is worthless. You're despicable. <laughs> In this case, they don't they don't care. I resemble that. Re- Somebody obviously is nominating and that's all that matters. And so they'll let any old person nominate. And this year, for the first time, somebody, a listener or I don't know who, uh, got on there and nominated us as a comedy podcast. And we've always tried to do our best to be funny, but our stories aren't funny necessarily. We may have had three humorous stories in a row. But it's an aberration. Like your taint. (laughs) But the last words of Daniel Shupak sure as hell was not a funny story. That was a depressing as hell story. And Plague Birds 2 right before that. Yeah, that was just a few episodes before the funny stories. So, you know, we're not always a funny story. I think we have more common, is it, for us to have a funny story though. At one point, it was just like every story is a straightforward kind of a story. They weren't trying to be funny. There might be humorous moments in the story, but we didn't have stories like The Question or Save the Date that uh, are 100% supposed to be funny. What about the Catastrophe Baker story? Yeah, those are obviously supposed to be funny because that's how Mike Resnick pitched them to us. He said, hey, do you want a tearjerker type story or a funny story? By the way, I do a lot of funny stories. I know nobody knows that. That's how we got that big thing. Right? <laughs> and so we said, well, hell, give us a funny story. Is that a conscious sh- shift that we've made? Is it because I thought that, hey, I don't get comedy or something like that and I need to start getting it? It may be that we passed on more stories we would have accepted had you been in the right frame of mind. It may also be that you are feeling lighter. I, I But... <laughs> In this case, it's no, just... No, I'm we- so much more depressed these days than I used to be that I need something to pick me up, so I accept those stories now. You are physically lighter than you used to be. <laughs> oh, there you go. But no, I think the answer is just we we put out whatever is produced in the order that the, our producers get it to us. And so we just so happen to have funny stories that people have done. And uh, I think that some of the other ones, the really heavy ones, we've had producers shy away from. And the ones that are funny, people jump on. So uh-huh. they get done faster. That's what I think. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe they're like, hey, this one sounds like fun. Yeah. Whereas the other ones, they go, unfortunate. Ooh, that sounds like a counter. I don't... Yeah, we'll skip that one. No one saw unfortunate. <laughs> but if you'd like more stories like unfortunate, you know what you can do? Tell me, Rich Outfield. You can get off your arse and write. I was talking to you, Big, not oh, them. They oh. can donate, but if you don't write... <laughs> There's not going to be any more unfortunates. <clears throat> Unfortunately. I don't know. Comedy is in the ear of the beholder. You know, That's case. true. And I hope that we're funny because we try to be, we try to entertain each other. But if somebody said you guys are inspiring or if somebody said that you guys are very sad or you guys are scary or whatever, I would take that also and be like, thank you. We- I've heard some people say you guys are irritating as hell. You guys suck. I rage quit your show. So, you know, you get that too. It all depends. You get enough of that at home that I don't know what. (laughs) You never know what people are going to like and what they won't like. It's like that whole thing that we've said probably a hundred times when we talk about writing. You know, you write your story and then you just keep sending it around because you don't know which editor is the right editor for that story. You might think you know, but then you send it to them. They're like, nah, this one doesn't work for me. And then you send it to the guy who... Every time he turns down that funny story, then you send it to him and he's like, oh, I love this one. So you you never know. Someone like me could suddenly decide that they like comedy. Someone as dour and sad. Humorless even. Pitiful as me could even say, hey, I like the funny story. Let's do funny stories. Yay. I'm like one of those uh, Hollywood execs. Oh, yeah, we need a funny story. That other funny story got a lot of hits. Let's do funny stories now. That's what's cool. Funny stories with lots of characters. Lots of, I just knew you were going to go with that. <laughs> and lots of big special effects. It's like, there's got to be a love triangle in every single movie we produce. Yeah. Uh, and Kristen Stewart. It's just so weird. how. That, okay, we're not even going to talk about movies. But it, that, that thing, that sort of thing, 
is so weird to me. I mean, there had to have been a time when people judged things by how they felt when they read the script, or it's like, oh, they, they, this sounded really good, or I got, I can get behind the passion of these, this director, or, you know, so and so is a, a popular actor right now, and they want to do this project, so we're doing it. But instead, it's just, you know. Women archers have to be in all of our movies right now. You know, we need women archers on fire. <laughs> Girls with red hair. This summer, there were three movies. You know, you're just like, come on. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, I guess I derailed the conversation. I don't know. Being a, an editor is weird. But it is kind of like that. It is kind of like being the movie studio exec that says, we're only going to do 15 episodes this year. So we need so and so many scary stories, and we need so and so. You know, I don't know. We don't really approach it that way, though. No, no, we don't. But I, we it, just say a story falls in our lap, and if we like it, we take it. If we don't, then we let somebody else have it. It's as simple as that. And unfortunately, there's not a real way to quantify that. We just want good stories, stories that speak to us. And you never know what that's going to be. Apparently, not even Nicole, who is our submissions editor, knows what that's going to be. We don't want any stories right now. Am I correct? And, <laughs> yeah, and, and there, there are different kinds of humorous stories, too. I, mean, I don't know that the talking, feeling appliances or pieces of furniture is funny in the same way that Hurricane Smith and Catastrophe Baker swapping stories is funny. Uh -huh. or, or the reporters asking uh, uh, whether you can... That's a question. Yeah. Yes. These, these sort of things. And, and that's fine. It's good that those things are different. The, the worst criticism that you can make about a musician, in my opinion, is that all their songs sound the same. Well, maybe that's not the worst criticism. I mean, the, the sound of their voice makes me wish for deafness is probably worse. But you know what I mean? You've heard people say, well, I don't want to listen to Dave Matthews band because all the songs sound exactly the same. And But it's just... It, it, I was going somewhere, and uh, I, lost I, I lost it. it. Just, just the thinking you of Dave Matthews. You had the cure I, to the plague of the 20th century, and you lost it. And I lost it. it. <laughs> That's too bad, because that would have been handy. What, what were you going to say? You, there, your, your mouth started to open. Oh, I was just going to say that I've heard people say that sometimes listening to our show... The Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine does not cause hearing loss, but sometimes it does make it seem like an option worth considering. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, announcer man. I think he was the one, actually, that leveled that criticism <laughs> on us before. So there you go. Next story with a talking refrigerator, announcer man will be the voice of that refrigerator. Ooh, that sounds Just good. donate to the show, folks, and ensure that that happens. That would be fun. Someday, someday we ought to make announcer man be the voice of a character. Don't go there. Somebody, somebody had something for announcer man to read for us. I, I, I remember years ago... Norm Sherman wanted announcer man to read. Yeah, something. he he wanted but announcer man year, on. Now let us praise awesome dinosaurs. I believe. But just this year, we got announcer man to read a part for somebody. Was it Clay was Duggar? Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. Oh, Marshall Latham yeah, over at the um, In Search of podcast. <laughs> what is it? Uh, the, the Journey that's incredible podcast. into the Journey into podcast. Dot dot dot. Cue the hate mail. Yeah, I don't... Has that aired yet? I don't think it has, because I think he still wanted us to intro a story, and he hasn't sent us any kind of intro of a story. Oh, spoilers then. But maybe mentioning it on the show will encourage him to actually use it. <laughs> I heard Announcer Man on the radio one time. Probably you hear him all the time. I don't. Never? I don't listen to the radio very often, though. I usually am listening to stuff off of my uh, own little device. I only listen to my own stories. Wait, <laughs> That's <what>? right. <laughs> Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. <laughs> what were we talking about before Announcer Man derailed us? Just the humor kind of thing? I think we were, yeah. And, uh, what? Oh, because Announcer Man said, listening to the d podcast won't cause deafness. You uh, were talking about how the worst thing you could say about an artist is that all their songs sound the same. So maybe you were going to talk about how our stories are different and that's cool. Okay. That's my guess is where you were headed with that. But you said... I you honestly were... don't know where I was headed with it, but that's a good point. And you know what? Maybe I, I'm totally wrong. Maybe somebody out there like Mariah Carey or somebody would love 
for somebody to say, oh, all my songs sound the same. Thank you. You know, just, I, I just. Yeah, she probably does. Oh, all my songs sound the same. Yeah, they sound like number one. Yeah. I've got more number ones than the Beatles, don't I? Warning, today's episode contains the C word. No, I, I don't know where I was going with that, but. Uh, hopefully all of our stories don't sound the same. I mean, we don't always narrate them ourselves. I don't always lead the vo- the main character. But maybe it would be good if somebody could hear and say, oh, that, that's a Dune Steve story. Maybe I'm contradicting myself. Maybe I don't know what I'm saying. Maybe I'm just taking up time so that we can get to the end and ask for donations. <laughs> what do you think? I think there's been a time or two where we've said, this one's not a Dune Steve story, as if that meant something per se. It probably meant I didn't like it. <laughs> and I think maybe there's been a time or two where other people have said, yeah, I was listening to the story and I just thought, wow, this doesn't sound like a Dune Steve story to me. This is weird. Well, I, I remember when we accepted Rain, that story. It was almost a a miracle that we accepted it. She had already rejected it or, um, or something. Or, <laughs> That's true. It didn't seem like something that somebody would send us. Yeah, I remember you saying that. It, it, it should be on uh, Podcastle or something like that. It just seemed like it belonged there as opposed to our show. And, you know, it's a shame that it didn't because so many people would have heard it had it been on a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. And now a word from our show. What is this? So just recently, Rish, you involved yourself in a contest, right? Yes, we were all on an island and there was one (laughs) coconut. It's a contest that you participated last year in as well. Oh, that. Yes. Um, Yes, that was the Masters of the Macabre contest. In fact, I think it's mastersofmacabre.wordpress.com. It's a contest that they did last year, and maybe they've done it before. It's a short story writing contest where there is a theme, an overall theme that all the stories will have to follow. Last year, it was phobias. So all the stories were about phobias, but each story was about a different phobia. Okay. And basically, you sign up, say, I want to be part of the contest, and they give you the last year phobia to write your story about this year it was curses and it was really fun last year so i said i'll do it again and and the curse they gave me was a cursed story and i thought oh well, that's interesting and so i tried to write a story about it and i i couldn't do it the best i could come up with was something that ripped off like the ring or ringu where there was a tale that you had to tell or you would die But the person that you told it to would then be cursed and have to tell the tale or they would die. I mean, basically, that's what a cursed story is. And I I just I tried and tried and I couldn't come up with anything that I liked, partly because I'm all I live in fear of somebody saying, oh, you just ripped off fill in the blank. So I emailed the guy because they they said, if you don't like your curse, you can request another one. But you can't go back to that first curse if you decide you don't like the second one even more. And the second curse that they gave me was the curse of Macbeth. And basically, that curse is it's a superstition. It's, it's been a tradition for centuries that if you're involved in a production of Macbeth, you do not say that name. You call it the Scottish play uh, or that play or break a leg or something like that. Well, it's it's totally <laughs> connected to that superstition of do not wish somebody good luck in a play. It's it's funny cuz there have been years of traditions and superstitions and, and worries about this thing to the point where there were all these theories of where the idea of this curse came from that that theater groups would be strapped for cash and they would choose to do the Scottish play And then after that play wrapped, the theater group would fall apart and they would there were they would declare bankruptcy or there things like that where they would just say, you know, there are many explanations for it. But the explanation I liked was that Shakespeare stole the witches dialogue from actual witches that he he saw a coven of witches and he wrote down the spells that they cast and they were so upset 
when he you know wrote this play that used their arcane rituals in it that they cursed the play and anybody who is ever involved in its production I, to me when i heard that i was just like oh my gosh i love it I love that idea and a story. It didn't just write itself, but I said, what if this or what if that? And I, I, I said, what about high school and all that? Last year, if you recall, I had until like the end of June or middle of June to write the story. And, and you get started it. in like March, if I remember sometime really early. You wrote it and then you're like, when does this do? It's like, do right away. Oh, F it. It's not due until June. And so you didn't do anything for it for three months. And then you rushed into it. You're totally right. You've got me down. And in, in some ways, that's helpful when you put a story away and then when you pick it up again after a couple of months or three months or whatever, you look at it with fresher eyes. Right. And in this case, it was already May. And I knew that I had until the middle of June or something like that. But I thought, well, I'll check to make sure what day in June it's due by. And I'll start it like the week before that. And I looked and it was May 11th. And I was just, oh, holy crap. Not only am I supposed to write this story, but I'm supposed to do an audio recording of it and get it to them. And it has to be under 15 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> There's just, the worst part of all for the likes of you. Well, that ended up being the worst part. And, and I sat down and I wrote it mostly in one day or one fevered night, and I knew that it was really short. But the next day, I read it aloud, and it took 27 minutes to read, as short <laughs> as it was. And it's like, oh, no, kind of thing. And so I had to hack and slash, and I was going to get you involved in reading one of the characters. You know, I thought it would be fun to do it full cast. Unfortunately, I wrote a story where the main characters are three girls. And so I didn't know what to do because there wasn't enough time to get three girls to do the parts. You volunteered to have like your 10 year old daughter do one of the parts and all that. And, and I, I, that might have worked. We'll never know now because I had to have it done immediately by the 11th. And I had to be within 15 minutes and all this stuff. So I just asked Renee Chambliss if she wouldn't mind performing these characters. And I, I was almost tempted to just say, read the whole story. Just read it and perform all the parts. Win me the contest. And win me the contest. She's got a great, great voice. And something that I didn't know she was capable of, she made each one of these girls sound different from one another. And not everybody can do that. There are professional yeah. audiobook readers where unless it says, Jim said, Tony asked, you've no idea who is talking because they just have a voice. And it may be a great voice, but they don't change it up or anything like that. And I asked her if she could make sure that they were understandable to the point where when I was editing it down, cause I had to, it was way too long, even hacking the story. I could take out Lee said, and you know, Tosh asks and stuff like that to make it shorter because she had switched up the voice. And so she did me a favor on that. Anyway, I guess I'm talking way too long, but the, the, the point of the contest, I guess, is this whole audio recording. It's, it's what we do. Uh -huh. Although I don't think most people do it full cast or anybody, but you can go there and listen to all of the stories from the different curses and then vote. And whichever one gets the most votes, that person gets crowned master of the macabre for a year. They make appearances They go to like grocery store openings, parades. That's right. All those kind of things. They, they visit many sick kids in the hospital. Yes. And so I, I, I hate the people that say, vote for me. Give us a podcast a nomination. Vote for, vote for us. Do this kind of thing. Give us a five-star review on, on iTunes, even though that's helpful to ask, I'm sure. But if you'd like to go over there and check out those stories, I'm sure there's some really, really good ones. And if you think that mine is really, really good, then yeah, go ahead and vote for me. I will not ask you not to vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will, though. Please don't vote for him. He sucks. Well, that's kind of the question, isn't it? <laughs> we'll see. I mean, when it's something like this, the proof is going to be in the pudding. And that and that's something that we could talk for an hour about of just, you know, was my story any good? I don't know. Would it have been better if I had started it back in April or March or whatever? You know, kind of thing. I, I don't know. There's no knowing. There's an alternate universe where I spent three months on it and it is full cast and there are, are there children and, and we used actual witches. 
and they curse the podcast because we use their voices. Podcast is already cursed. <laughs> Anyhow, I just I figured I would plug that. It was fun to write. I like the people over there at Masters of the Macabre, and I, I, you know I feel bad that you didn't get to participate in it because you cut my character out while oh, yeah, slicing the uh, that's, story. That's up. A, that's another conversation too. But it's like, how do you get a four thousand word story down to fifteen minutes? And the idea I came up with was to eliminate characters. And anytime they're referred to, anytime they have any dialogue or whatever, they're gone. But it wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> All the male characters, pretty much except one, had to go. And it still wasn't enough. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you for indulging me, for letting me talk about that. It is fun to write. And it's fun to podcast your stories. And uh, it's fun to have listeners. Yeah, so if you uh, head over there and check that out, you can listen to Rish's story. You don't even have to donate. It's like a free incentive episode. So head over there and listen <laughs> to Rish's story. And uh, if you like it, you can uh, vote for it. That's right, except that the conversation afterward is happening now. Yeah, there you go. You've already heard the uh, post-story conversation. Okay, check it out, folks. One more thing that we wanted to mention before we go... Friend of the show, Righteous Dude at Righteous Dude Cast. Actually, no, it, it was just Clay Duggar, not Righteous Dude, not affiliated. You're not affiliated with me. You know what? This may be our silliest episode ever. You think so? I, I'm, I'm worried it may be. Yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's too silly. <laughs> there you go. Clay Duggar did a reading of what was the story called? Who Goes There? The John W. Why do I keep saying W? John W. Campbell story, Who Goes There? A classic in science fiction, the basis for The Thing from Another World and The Thing remake and The Thing prequel remake, also called The Thing. And The Brother from Another Planet, I think. We have awesome. talked about this. <laughs> anyway, that's up. I don't have the website, though, so. There's a link in the show notes. I'm not going to say the web page out loud because it's probably got a bunch of numbers and like characters and things like that maybe it doesn't i don't know well, it seems like we've talked about this before maybe it was the last episode that clay edited for us i brought it up probably. but that is out there now i play the character of conant can't remember who played him in the movie i guess it doesn't matter now because they're all dead is uh, wilford brimley dead yet i don't think so he was in the thing he was in the thing. Yeah. That thing you do? <laughs> no. <laughs> so we've come to the end of the episode, but we needed to give just a little plug. This has been a very unusual week for you. There was kind of a danger plus disaster plus <laughs> catastrophe plus baking. <laughs> Yeah, no. well, there was no catastrophe. There was danger and disaster, and there was a third thing that starts with D. But I, was there destruction? There was destruction, although that might also count in the disaster. This is a little teaser for you. Something was a total loss. <laughs> you had a bad weekend, and some people already know a little bit about it, but we sat down and talked at length about your very bad day. And if you want to go over to That Gets My Goat, what is the URL for our blog? The blog is doonsteef.blogspot.com. That is up right now. We talked for over an hour just about this terrible day and what might have happened and what didn't happen and what at the moment you thought was going to happen. And it just to me, it was a really, really crappy day. <laughs> and I didn't even have any. <laughs> and you to didn't do with even know you weren't even the one that had it happen to you. But I figured we, it was an important enough thing that uh, I mentioned it on Facebook. You mentioned it on Facebook and people might want to know about it. And if they don't usually listen to that gets my goat, but they want to know about it, go over there. And that episode is up. That's right. You can find out about my adventure being evacuated from my home because of a nearby wildfire. It's a, it's a more extensive adventure than just what was described. That's just the teaser, everybody. <laughs> I figured we ought to mention it here because it was significant. Right. And not everybody listens to That Gets My Goat. So if you're interested, you can go uh, check it out and listen to it and hear the whole story. Because I have spoken to no one more extensively about the uh, adventures of that day than Rish on that recording. So you can hear it all. Wow. 
And uh, if they feel inclined, they may donate. <laughs> right. We might as well ask for donations one more time, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, see, I didn't let anybody know, but I was going for the record. Oh, did you get it? No. Uh, I think Dead Robot Society still has a speed to darn it. So. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah, I guess that's our show for this week. It is. Well, maybe for this month. Yeah, there Just, you go. It might not be if people donate. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't know why I keep asking. It just it, it seemed like it would be funny to, because I hate to ask for donations, to do it again and again and again. But it wasn't funny. Not at all. It was sad, really. It'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. I just said that announcement, but... He yes, just, thank he you. He just wanted to put a button on it for you. He did. Good job. Press the button. Yeah. Oh, oh look well, at well, that. Oh, that was uh, clever. Nice. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Sheila Crosby, for sending us this story. Thank you, Tobias Queen, for producing. Uh, big for doing your part as well. Everybody who lent a voice. Thanks to uh, Nicole for second guessing yourself and giving us this story to, to read so that we, it made it onto the show. And thanks for all the other work you do, Nicole, because. You're awesome. Then yeah, have a good week to 18 days, folks. <laughs> yes. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Michelle Field. Ciao. Thanks for listening. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. On three, everybody make fun of Rish. Isn't that what it's all about? Take two. You're supposed to ask yourself, why not? There was actually a why not reference in this story. Remember? Oh. Where he's like, why did I drop out? It's like, what? I could have gone back. Why not go back? Uh, he'd never asked himself that question. Yeah, oh. there we go. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.